You're not completely fit for duty, but you're not unfit for duty. So how do you and your flight department deal with the gray area in between? From the National Business Aviation Association, this is Flight Plan. I'm Pete Combs with your trusted source for business aviation news. In our last episode, we talked about several new tools for determining duty fitness. They include a fatigue meter, which quantifies duty fatigue in an objective way, allowing flight departments to make good decisions on a crew member's ability to fly. There's also the PVT, the Psychomotor Vigilance Test, an industry standard which is growing in acceptance throughout business aviation. Joining me now is Dr. Quay Snyder, CEO of the Aviation Medicine Advisory Service, Greg Farley, Chief Safety Pilot for John Deere, and Daniel Mollicone, CEO of Pulsar Informatics. Guys, thanks for joining me here on NBAA's Flight Plan. I want to start with Greg. How do you deal with fitness for duty issues where we're not at either end of the spectrum? The pilot is neither completely fit nor completely unfit for duty. I think the first thing you, that, that flight departments do, and, and one of the things that we put out as a, a, a fitness for duty a working group was a fitness for duty policy statement, and we put that out last year, and it's our first iteration at it. Um, and what we were trying to get flight departments to do is to think about this before it happens. You know, and, and I think that, that that comes down to basic SMS. The first rule or the first step of mitigating risk is to know the risk. And so we, we put a tool that, that or a, a policy statement that departments could review, and it talks about, you know, have, have programs in place, have policies in place, provide services to, to the people, because it is. I mean, if someone walks in the door and they're having a massive heart attack, it's going to be very apparent that they're not fit to do. But if they come in and, and they've had a, a, an argument with a spouse or, or they're going through financial troubles, and if they're not talking about it, it's very difficult to to determine that this is going on. And so you have to have ways of, of seeing things develop. And I think you could go into, uh, I know some companies are doing, uh, uh, and Quay, you know a lot about this, they're doing kind of peer counseling where, where employees and managers are, are being trained to, uh, to, to be able to talk, but it's also so that they can recognize these things that are going on. And, and I think one tool that we're, we're just starting to look at is scheduling. So, you know, scheduling oftentimes they're the ones that are getting the request for, hey, uh, do you think this trip's going to go long? Hey, can I have this day off? Can I trade this day? And and not that those are indicative of someone is having uh, problems, but it could be a flag. And so scheduling might be able to kind of backfeed and say, hey, I, I think maybe, you know, as a safety manager, maybe talk to this guy and see what's going on. And and uh, I think we're good that we get lots of phone calls. Hey, this is going on in my life. Okay, that's great. Why don't you, no penalty, we'll, I'll cover your trip for you. You know, you stay home and do what you need to do. But it is a very gray area and it's very difficult to move into when you're talking mental health and substance abuse of, of getting into that. And that's where, uh, you know, Quake can for sure talk on how does a flight department get involved into not really trying to pry into someone's personal life, but to ascertain whether they have stuff going on at home. Greg, you hit on one very important point. It's critical to have a plan in place beforehand so you know how to deal with these situations when they come up. One possible way of communicating those gray areas, and it's widely known the I'm safe checklist, illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and what used to be emotions now is eating and hydration. Um, but that's a good personal self-assessment. However, I think the individual is um, deficient in being able to do an accurate self-assessment. Um, we are all very accomplished people. We want to continue the mission. We want to do it and we uh, deny that uh, we're compromised in any way. So I think if uh, someone is going through the I'm safe checklist and it's a crew situation, there ought to be validation with the other crew member and an exchange of information. That gets into a little bit of the pre-flight checking, but as a broad guide that I give to corporate flight departments, if the conversations about what's happening outside the aircraft, 
such as the divorce or the financial difficulties that you referred to, is intruding into the aircraft, then we've lost our ability to compartmentalize those safety-sensitive responsibilities that we have. And that's something the individual pilot can recognize or a fellow pilot or even uh, a fellow crew member, a flight attendant might recognize and say, uh, this person is functioning perhaps in an area where they haven't recognized yet uh, the compromised situation they're in. How do you communicate that assessment without raising the ire of the person uh, that you're talking about? How do you do that in a way, or do you, do you have to set that stage beforehand, Quay, to talk to somebody uh, and say, look, uh, I'm, we might make that assessment, just no, nothing personal. I mean, how do you do that? You're exactly correct. Um, you have to be in a situation where um, the person doesn't feel like they're being called out, yet uh, the company uh, needs to have a corporate philosophy that they will support this so that it's not stigmatized. If a person calls out individually or a fellow pilot raises a concern about another pilot, and that's why what Greg said at the beginning is so important. You have to have a company policy that's in writing about how we will handle this uh, to go forward. And when you first institute it, it's challenging because people haven't built the trust that it's a just culture within the cockpit and inside the company. But as it continues and the company supports that and pilots see that there are not negative consequences but a positive outcome, then it's self-fulfilling at that point and becomes a very strong part of the safety management system. And I think that having a, a good safety management system in place that has been demonstrated um, as, as being just helps with this. Um, you know, it, 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 if, if I can go to scheduling and I don't have to disclose anything, and any one of our managers can do this and say, this person needs to be off this trip. There's no questions asked. We don't get the why, we don't get the, hey, but that's going to really hurt us. It's, there's no questions asked. And, and so, and this goes back to, you know, one of the things that, that I'm overcome by events or I'm distracted by events. A way to tap out without having the air, you know, things that may be very personal to you, um, that, you know, if, if you're overcome by events, there's no questions asked. That's a hard stop. And what we're hoping is that, that pilots, schedulers, maintenance staff, uh, ground handlers, anybody could, with this policy in place, could walk in and say, I'm overcome by events. And then the first words out of the, the manager's or the supervisor's mouth is, what can we do to help you? Here are the, the services that we have as a company subscribed to to help you. You know, here's our EAP. Here's here's our phone number for aviation medical advisory service. Here's uh, Medair. Here's the local hospital. Here's every number and give them those resources to let them find the path that they need. We talked about distracted by events as opposed to I'm unable to, I, I am uh, overcome by events. Uh, Daniel, when we talk about, that's an emotional assessment, that's probably a self-assessment, at least initially. But I wonder, when you look at the fatigue meter, when you look at tools like uh, the, the PVT, is there a middle ground there that you're still able to fly, but you're not 100%? There's incapacitation, that is, I am not fit for duty. And then there is, I have uh, mild to moderate deficits whether it's an alertness deficit or whether it's an emotional issue that I'm working through, I'm coping, but it's something that I'm working through. Uh, for that middle ground, uh, what we recommend is to brief it, to communicate it as part of the um, uh, flight risk assessment, to uh, ensure there's communication between the two flying pilots, uh, what issues are at play is, um, well, Bob, how are you doing? Uh, I didn't get the best sleep of my of my life last night. I'm fit for duty, but um, it it's, could be a factor on this flight that I want you to be aware of. And um, one of the airlines that we support um, has a uh, a flight card in the flight deck. And when fatigue is briefed as a as a hazard, that is, um, it hasn't reached the threshold where uh, the pilot's no longer fit for duty, and we need to replace that pilot with a reserve. But um, it's something to be concerned about. Um, there's a set of rules that they follow to mitigate any potential human factors, incidents, and, and those um, uh, mitigations are things like uh, no non-precision approaches. 
uh, maximum use of automation. So to the extent possible, if there's an automated system on the board, let the automated system do the work, um, which takes out the human element. Um, telling uh, air traffic control uh, unable if air traffic control wants to uh, change your approach. Uh, that is to simplify the task of flying and landing safely so as to remove any threat of uh, incidents from uh, someone who may make a mistake associated with fatigue or a deficit state. So just being aware of, uh, of and talking about marginal states is very valuable as well as talking about states where you're, you've gone past the threshold and you're incapacitated. Just hearing this, I, I think this is a great idea. I'm sitting here and my mind is racing going, okay, this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to go home on Monday and I'm going to devise this card and I'm going to recommend it that it become a, a way that we operate. And, and it could be a, a change state. I mean, we, we do an awares briefing card and you have airports, weather, um, routing, environmental, and then the, the last step of that is self. And so during that self-assessment that ever the crew is supposed to be doing, if any of these flags, whether I'm distracted or I didn't sleep well, then we go to this raised minimums. And, and that, that's how we operate. But the, it could also be put in place because we do long flights. And, and we do kind of do this already. Hey, it's been 10 hours. I'm going to leave the autopilot on all the way down to, to minimums. And so now it's just kind of giving us a standard by which to do that when you're, you're, you have degraded performance. It doesn't have to necessarily be at the start of the trip. It could occur during the trip that you now become distracted or fatigued. And now you can just raise the standard, raise the minimums for the crew operating. I, I think it's a great idea. I want to take uh, the concept of um, what you've talked about from a, a large flight department perspective and what you've talked about from an industry perspective. And Quay, I want to ask you, uh, when we talk about trying to mitigate some of these factors that affect fitness for duty, it seems to me it is a much more difficult proposition when you have a smaller flight department, when you have a one or two person flight department, how do you deal with these issues then? You're right, Pete, it's extremely difficult because the pressure to perform the flight is there. It really comes down to a corporate or individual philosophy about a commitment to safety and drawing hard lines about where you are. Um, it's difficult though in those flight departments because you don't have the resources of a larger corporate flight department or certainly of an airline uh, to do that. But if there's that commitment to safety and the hard lines drawn before the flight ever occurs, before the situation ever arises, before the sickness uh, ever happens, then it's a little bit easier. I don't mean to pretend that it's still an easy call to make because of the pressures, but um, it's much easier to make it if you have, as Dan said, a card that says, okay, this crosses over our threshold for some sort of event, and either we use safer operations, safer strategies to minim mitigate our risk, or we stop the risk by not doing the flight. I think you can include uh, in smaller flight departments, you know, the, the department's going to report to somebody in the company and offering to, to educate them on, on these sciences and, and the research and, and the way the industry is trending. Um, at least you're giving them information, even though they may not, um, they have a business need to do what they need to do, but at least they have an understanding now of what's going on uh, in the industry. The other thing is, is one of the first steps in risk mitigation is identifying the risk. And, and it may be that you do have to take the mission, but at least be honest with the, the crew what our risk is. I am fatigued. This is a very long day. We have to do this mission. Let's raise our minimums today. Let's do everything we can to be vigilant. Let's go into some uh, strategic use of caffeine. Let's make sure we get a good night's sleep. Let's do everything that we can but you, you, to at least understand the risk. To understand the risk, you have to do some measure of self-assessment. And I'd like to again focus on a smaller department and ask, when we talked about um, sort of in a larger department or in at least a two-pilot situation, I ask you, Greg, how are you feeling today? Or if I hear you say something that triggers my interest, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and I'm going to help in the assessment. In a smaller department, where you may only be the one pilot in the department, how do you make that assessment? How do you even approach making that assessment? 
The, well, uh, the fatigue meter, um, a single pilot can go in and, and put in their schedule, even if they don't have a scheduling program, and, and at least get an idea of you know, how they slept or, or how their work schedule and their sleep schedule has affected them. And, and that's available to just about anybody, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. The fatigue meter, uh, we support uh, some of the largest airlines in the world, and we support uh, single pilot flight departments and it's applicable across that spectrum. And both the fatigue meter that is tracking your work, uh, your duty time, your flight times, and, and your rest patterns, uh, but also uh, doing a, a PVT self-assessment will give you a number that is an objective, cold, hard fact that um, helps guide your thinking. And I think the other thing is, is uh, when you say things aloud, and, and, and this is, I believe, taught in single pilot, is, is you still verbalize stuff as though you're flying with someone else. So when you're doing that self-assessment, verbalize it to yourself. Hey, I, I didn't sleep real well last night. I'm, I'm going to be a little slow. Because you, you're verbalizing it as though someone else was there. And, 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 and maybe Quay or Daniel can help me out. Is, is that makes it a little bit more meaningful to yourself. Quay, is that, is that the case? I, absolutely. I fly single pilot uh, probably 50% of the time that I fly. And I do the I'm safe checklist out loud to myself and refer to it. I do my checklist in the air out loud as if I'm accountable to someone else. I wanted to follow up on a point that Dan made too. Um, You have these objective tools, uh, particularly with respect to fatigue and to a limited extent you have it with illness and medications because there are specific policies on medications. But there's a, a cruder but more effective tool too. And you can ask yourself, would I put my family in an aircraft with a pilot who feels like I do right now? And if you can't answer yes to that, then you probably shouldn't go on that trip. So if nothing else, it's a great place to start. Yeah. You've been listening to a conversation on duty fitness with Dr. Quay Snyder, CEO of the Aviation Medical Advisory Service, Greg Farley, Chief Safety Pilot for John Deere, and Daniel Mullicombe, CEO of Pulsar Infomatics. There's plenty more information on the NBAA website. Just go to nbaa.org and search on the term fitness for duty. And that's the latest from the National Business Aviation Association. Remember, you can subscribe to all flight plan podcasts at Apple's iTunes website or download them from nbaa.org. I'm Pete Combs. Thanks for listening to Flight Plan.